Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about investors in war profiteering. Our guest, Stavrula Pax, is a writer, comedian, and media PhD student at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens in Athens, Greece. She is normally in Athens, but now in Ohio. Her writing has appeared in publications including Responsible Statecraft, Reductrist, Al Meadin, and The Gray Zone. And you can keep up with her work by subscribing to her Substack at stavrulapapst.substack.com. Stavrula, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the articles you are writing. Um, your recent article at Responsible Statecraft is called Do Venture Capitalists Want Forever War? Um, I, I, I want to know the answer to that question, but, but who are venture capitalists and what are they doing? Right. So this is actually a good thing for us to start with. Venture capitalists, generally speaking, it's interesting because we have to talk about them generally, but what they've done is in recent years, they've creeped into the weapons industry. And generally speaking, venture capital is a risky form of business. Um, venture capitalists essentially invest hundreds of millions of dollars into startups they believe will be successful under the understanding that most of them will fail, but those that are successful and become larger companies will be able to return to them very high rates of returns. Uh, what's gone on in recent years is that venture capitalists have moved into the defense industry or the weapons industry as well, and they've essentially flooded funding into a new generation of weapons industry startups, including Anduril, Palantir, Shield AI, Clearview AI. And a lot of these startups are essentially, uh, you could say that they're giving traditional defense contractors a run for their money because they've been crowding this space where, of course, the general industry of weapons is relying heavily on government contracts. So venture capitalists are coming into the industry. They're flushing it with cash. And uh, this new generation of weapon startups, therefore, is able to kind of come to the top with the assistance of their help. And unfortunately, what's that, what that's translated into in terms of recent conflicts, especially in Ukraine, and now, unfortunately, the war or the genocide in Gaza, I'd like to say, is that they are using this time, these VC-backed uh, weapon startups are really unfortunately using uh, these current conflicts as a testing ground for a number of dangerous technologies that probably there should be a lot of ethical debate about that's being bypassed. So we're seeing a lot of AI powered weaponry, for example, proliferate in Ukraine. And I think it's very dangerous. And due to VCs not really being accountable to the public, they're venture capitalists, they're in this for the money, and my opinion is that they're in this for the, the power as well, but it's very hard to hold them accountable for their actions because they're essentially saying, look, I'm putting money into these new weapon startups. If they fail, they fail, but if they succeed, that's good for me. And so it, it's unfortunately, in my opinion, steering the direction of war in a much more dangerous and hard to predict way because it's becoming even more about money and profit than it was previously, if that's possible. Does, does this predate the war in Ukraine or is it largely coming out of that? We've seen this huge growth in weapons spending and NATO members and new uh, weapons contracts and all the free weapons for Ukraine from the United States. Is, is, is that what's driving this? It definitely predates the war, but I think it is a more recent phenomenon. I, I would say that venture capitalists in general have long been doing risky investing like this in a number of sectors that buys them influence. But uh, as I noted in Responsible Statecraft, VC funding in weapons startups has doubled from 2019 through 2023. So the phenomenon predates the war, but I think unfortunately the war in Ukraine has provided, uh, you know, essentially 
a, a much easier pathway for people to run startups in, in this sector, right? Because unfortunately, the war in Ukraine, as both of us probably think, I unfortunately don't see an end to it anytime soon. And so it's easy for weapons contractors and these newer VC-backed weapons contractors to say, look, uh, clearly we're in a time of crisis. If you fund my weapons startup, I'll be able to support Ukraine or whoever it is with the weapons they need to beat the enemy. And I think, unfortunately, this new I wouldn't say new era of conflict, but these conflicts that are now proliferating that are certainly apparently longer term conflicts definitely makes it easier for these new VC backed weapons groups to flood the space. More venture capitalists see that newer uh, VC backed weapons contractors like Andu, Rill and Palantir are now becoming quite successful and now they're going to continue unfortunately to flood the market as much as they can because they want the conflict the contracts that are coming from this and as you can understand the weapons budget for the united states the military budget is only getting larger and larger indeed it is are, are these new companies getting these contracts through merit-based competition or the traditional means of corruption? Uh, probably a combination of both, but there is definitely a lot. I, I would say if you look at a lot of the behavior of these VC-backed groups, a lot of them are actively working to influence policymaking processes like many standard defense contractors. Uh, for example, I think Andrew Rill was recent. It's been recently reported that Andrew Rill was lobbying Congress members against the regulation of AI, for example. So here we see an example where they're actively working to influence Congress in ways that benefit them in a way that's potentially dangerous. Uh, last year, a number of venture back venture capital backed startups in the weapons industry. Uh, they wrote a public letter, and I think 13 of them signed on to this, essentially saying, we need better access to the United States defense budget. We need to be able to better procure these funds so that we can develop these weapons uh, to the best of our ability. Because if we don't do this, and I think, unfortunately, they're able to play this card quite frequently in their political discussions, if we don't do this, uh, the United States will be fa fall behind geopolitically, both in the context of war, but also in just standard uh, power competition between the powers. So there's a lot of a lot of this going on. We've also seen, I think, outright cor corruption. Uh, in the case of Rebellion Defense, which is a newer VC-backed weapons startup uh, backed by Eric Schmidt, it's a new it's a new organization, and yet two of its members were on the Biden administration's transition team. So you see a situation where nobody knows who they are, yet they're already in uh, high levels of policymaking processes. So we're seeing that they understand they would like to both lobby or do whatever it is possible to have this very close relationship with the government, which probably they're thinking then in turn is that this will translate into a good relationship and therefore weapons contracts that will benefit them in the long run, which means high levels of investment returns for venture capitalists. What what are some of these new weapons that are being used or tested in, in Ukraine, AI weapons and other new weapons, and what is particularly disturbing about them? Sure. Uh, there's been a number of new weapons being tested out in Ukraine and also, it, unfortunately, in the Gaza Strip. And as I had reported some in Unlimited Hangout, a lot of, not everything, but a lot of the new technology is AI powered. Um, I can talk a little about, about, you know, Palantir, Clearview AI, and they're all backed by venture capitalist Peter Thiel, who is... Yeah, I think he has so much money into these industries that he's able to dictate the future of AI and the future of the tech industry as a whole. But a lot of it is um, 
For example, Clearview AI does a lot of facial recognition software, and I think it's quite controversial. It had come up here in the United States a few years ago, and it was actually banned amongst most of the private sector. Law enforcement can still use it, though. Uh, people were creeped out about it because, essentially, Clearview AI mass scrapes people's faces from wherever possible, perhaps on the internet, social media, exam for, for example, and they have a database. So if you have some Somebody's face, you can connect that face to wherever else Clearview AI has gotten somebody's picture from. Uh, nobody liked this. You know, there was bad press about it. And so it was functionally banned in most of the United States. But uh, in Ukraine, Clearview AI has seen a new uh, opportunity to kind of rehabilitate its image, let's say. So they have been able to sell their service. They literally gave their services to Ukraine for free. They've had a number of media segments showing, ah, we're able to use mass facial recognition technology to identify Russian spies, to identify the dead, understand who's fighting this war and when. And, you know, it's helping us to do well in this conflict. So you're actively seeing uh, facial recognition technologies powered by AI that no one likes and no one wanted. It was functionally banned in most of the United States. It This company is using war as an excuse to be able to come back and become more normalized. So I would say that's quite dangerous. The other thing that I've seen a lot of, and there are multiple versions and uh, iterations of this, but we're essentially seeing a lot of large language models power various AI instruments that then you can use AI suggestions to be able to man semi-autonomous lethal drones. And, you know, Palantir's, um, it's called the Intelli Advanced Intelligence Platform Defense. It's kind of like chat GPT. I don't want to say it's exactly the same thing, but Palantir's AI programming says, we've collected and synthesized all this data about the enemy in that field like 10 kilometers from here. This is our suggestions about how you could proceed with maybe your drone or whatever weapons technology you'd like. Would you like to execute this action? And so then the operator, the person operating the machiner is then able to just press a few buttons and then the technology does it. You know, the, the drone is then able to perform semi these uh, semi-autonomous and then sometimes lethal actions, what this means in practice and especially in the years to come is that autonomous drone warfare is being normalized. And I think what's dangerous about this is that it depersonalizes war. Of course, all, all war, in my opinion, is unethical, but it, it's now making it so that you don't have to fire, you don't personally need to fire a weapon. You now can sit at your computer and essentially have these AI programs help you do it where you push the buttons and it carries it out. And I think a lot of these technologies, they're looking to expand them into doing this into a mass level where perhaps uh, the AI powered software could command hundreds of drones at once. So we're looking into an era where mass destruction could be carried out by AI. I find that very dangerous because it's bypassing critical ethics conversations. It's making war even less personalized. And, um, you know, what could be done with that technology is that it could be used at a mass scale and cause mass destruction, is my opinion. I find it very dangerous to be done without critical ethical conversations, which these companies want to bypass. I, I couldn't agree more, although I think the, the drones where somebody's ordered to push a button uh, also don't involve any moral considerations. But the, mm -hmm. the, facial, the facial recognition thing, uh, I, I mean, you can go into an airport in the United States knowing you're allowed to refuse to have them take a picture of your face, but they'll take it if you get anywhere near the camera without asking. So there must yes. be now a giant database uh, in the hands of the US government of the face of anybody who's gone in a US airport, right? Yeah, I, I, I kind of funny enough, I was in an airport the other day and I was actually able to refuse the service. They tell you that if you're a U.S. citizen, they theoretically hold, hold on to the photo only for a few hours. But who really knows what they're doing with these technologies, even if they say that there are certain uh, ethical uh, considerations being made, I think that when we're looking at this, we have to understand that within the context of war, 
I'm not convinced that ethics are at the forefront of anyone's mind. Instead, a lot of these weapons contractors and people that are supporting the these wars continuations can essentially say like, look, if Ukraine doesn't have access to the, these weapons or now in the current genocide in Gaza, if Israel doesn't have access to these weapons, they will lose. So I think unfortunately some of these ethical considerations are getting bypassed partially due to the poor coverage of both. Uh, I don't want to call what's going on in, in Gaza a co conflict because it's a genocide, but what's going on in both regions, unfortunately, uh, ethics are not at the forefront because a lot of it's about saying, if I don't have these technologies, if I don't have the most state-of-the-art war technologies, I'm going to lose against the enemy. And I, I think, unfortunately, it's, it's similar, I think, in places like airports because they're essentially allowed to say, or they try to make the argument that, you know, Americans' national security comes first. We therefore need to take on this route of safety to be able uh, to, to do this. And so we're going to use these cutting edge technologies to do it. They're not really putting ethics into the forefront of the conversation. And certainly going back to venture capitalists, they definitely not, because they're, of course, their primary reason for being there is of course a high rate of it returns on their investments by having these companies these weapons companies be successful but as far as i'm concerned they're also interested in the power that comes with having uh, a stake in these companies because that means if your money goes into we successful weapons contractors you have a direct say in terms of how these technologies proliferate and how they are used in the future so unfortunately it's both about um, you know, winning conflict. It's about having political influence and power, and it's about the money. I think all of that, unfortunately, bypasses ethics. Absolutely does. Uh, Stavrula, perhaps you also have an article uh, at unlimitedhangout.com called How Peter Thiel Linked Tech is Fueling the Ukraine War. Uh, what do you mean by fueling it, and, and how are they doing that? Sure. Um, I would say that they're fueling these these weapons contractors. It's a little bit of what we've discussed, but I would say that they're interested in fueling this war because as we can understand with dis, the traditional defense contractors, the traditional defense contractors rely and they thrive upon contract uh, on contracts, which means they thrive upon conflict. I think the same thing can very much be said about these VC backed groups that are now using Ukraine as a testing ground for their technologies, right? Uh, a company like Anduril understands that it's high performance in a war like Ukraine means that it will be able to have a good track record for procuring future contracts, right? For them and for similar uh, VC backed companies in the space, as I've said, obviously, Peter Thiel is a very powerful venture capitalist. He funded all the groups I reported on in the Ukraine piece, if anybody would like to check it out. But for Peter Thiel's bottom line of getting a high uh, return on investments, it's directly beneficial for him and for these companies that the war continues. I, uh, Palantir's CEO, Alex Karp, had even said, I think, quote unquote, that bad times are good for Palantir. So I, I think, unfortunately, when you have these influential weapons companies and these in influential venture capitalists also in this space, they understand, unfortunately, that indefinite war is nice for their bottom line. I think this is especially a scary situation in Ukraine because, as we said earlier, it seems like the conflict could go on for a long time. I think, unfortunately, the West is not interested in diplomacy. And it, to me, it seems like a stalemate that's going to continue, even though I think some people from NATO, like Macron, has repeatedly said they've considered sending troops into Ukraine as well. So that, of course, is good for the weapons uh, startup's bottom line. What we're also seeing, I can just bring this up quickly, but we're, we're seeing that there's a lot of weapons startups also in Ukraine that are especially interested in drone warfare. So the longer the conflict goes on, the better it is for those startups. And a lot of those startups in Ukraine are also being funded by the same venture capitalists. So Eric Schmidt has funded 
and I don't remember the name of the organization, but he's helped fund some military organizations in Ukraine that assist some of these drone startups. So there's an understanding that if war continues, that's good for these startups. It's also now a good market for new startups to come in which is, of course, very dangerous in the long term, both for the war, but also for the development and proliferation and normalization of these uh, questionable AI-powered weapons technologies that I've spoken about. Yes, very well said. Uh, people like Peter Thiel, who are apparently profiting in a huge way from the war in Ukraine, are they also still funding Donald Trump? And if so, is there any conflict there? Um. I don't actually know as much about Peter Thiel's ongoing. Uh, he's changed some of his positions in recent years. I will tell you in the years previously, Peter Thiel has funded a number of successful Republican candidates. And he also, uh, Michael Kratzios was a higher up person in Donald Trump's administration in the defense sector. And this Kratzios person has a close relationship with Peter Thiel where he, he had served as like, uh, he had served as like the chair of innovation or something like this on, on one of Peter Thiel's previous companies. So you see a clear situation where Peter Thiel's impact on Congress is obvious. I, I think that Peter Thiel, though, has said he won't fund anybody this time around. So I don't want to speak exactly on what he is currently doing. I would say that there is a track record in general, for Peter Thiel, he has generally funded a number of candidates. Uh, Palantir has also lobbied Congress in a number of ways. Somebody from Palantir right now, you know, the, he he's advising Congress on tech matters. So you see a very clear relationship between Peter Thiel and other venture capitalists with um with the Trump administration, but also generally speaking, whoever the pol the president is, they're interested in steering things in their favor either way. And I, I think that's especially true with the Democratic Party. As I had said earlier, uh, a couple people from Rebellion Defense and Eric Schmidt backed uh, VC Tech Group. Uh, it's a newer organization, and yet a couple people were already on the Biden administration team. So some of this, as far as I can see, it doesn't necessarily matter what administration we're talking about people from these VC firms, people from the VC backed defense firms will try to show up to these spaces. They will try to steer matters in their way. And I think, unfortunately, what that translates to in practice is that we have uh, conflicts going on that most Americans don't really like. I mean, I think a lot of Americans increasingly would like us to get out of Ukraine, for example. Like, we want diplomacy in Ukraine increasingly, and mer many Americans want at least a ceasefire in Gaza. But what you're seeing, partially due to the influence of these VCs and due to the influence of other players in the weapons industry, is that, you know, and APAC, which is a whole nother thing, you know, what we're seeing is that despite the fact that many Americans don't want these conflicts, uh, the, the government seems to have no intention and the West in general seems to have no intention on budging, right? Which means we're in a situation where there is continuous desire from those at the very top for these conflicts, which then people are forced to fight in, people are forced to die in. Well, certainly Donald Trump has a record of increasing military spending, just like, mm -hmm. Biden, just like Obama, et cetera. But he claims he would send no more weapons to Ukraine. And I wonder if that is costing him any money. Um, hmm. But I but I wanted to, to ask, we've got uh, four or five minutes left. Is, is Silicon Valley in general becoming more a part of the military industrial complex uh, and is there resistance to that from any quarters? Sure. Um, this is an interesting question because the more I look into it, the more I think that Silicon Valley and the military industrial complex have never really been that separated. That's the stance I tend to take, unfortunately. Granted, the, re the exact relationship can change over time, but as far as I see it, um, Silicon Valley exists in part because the military industrial complex wants it to exist. 
Um, I think some of this has become more obvious in recent years, and a number of private players have assisted, like private Silicon Valley players that are not really weapons contractors have assisted the Ukrainian war front, for example, like Amazon Mike, and Microsoft, for example, they've both helped the, the Ukrainian government store like government files on their software, which I think is kind of bizarre. Like, why is this private player um, that directly involved in government affairs, right? Like, why is it this on the forefront of a war and on the war effort. I, I think, unfortunately, it's becoming the norm. And my understanding of this is that there have been people in the tech space that have, you know, kind of tried to resist this. Um, I don't know if you remember, like, I think this was in 2018, Google tried to take on Project Maven, which is I don't remember everything about it, but it was this very controversial military project that Google was slated to take on. A lot of people at Google said, we don't want our, our, you know, our expertise to be used in this way. We find it controversial and bad for Google to work this explicitly with the military. We don't want to do this. Uh, so Palantir took on Pro Project Maven instead. But I, I think, unfortunately, my understanding of the industry is it's becoming more difficult for tech workers to, to, to try to resist this because it seems like many players in the big tech space are actively going along with the status quo. Um, if I turn this back a little bit to VC, you know, Palantir and Andrew will have both made pro-Israel statements. They're very clear with where they stand on these conflicts. So I, I think it's become more difficult for standard tech workers to be able to resist that. But my opinion is that the relationship is becoming more explicit with these wars, but I tend to assume that unfortunately the relationship with Silicon Valley and the military, military industrial complex has always been um, like peanut butter and jelly. And I think what's critical to say about that, unfortunately, is that and it's kind of an obvious point, but it's really not, is that, you know, the con the technologies developed in our personal lives could obviously be used in war, and the technologies developed in war could obviously be used in our personal lives. And I think that's especially scary considering, like, drone warfare, but also, like, surveillance tech. Um, you know, whatever surveillance technologies that are being developed in places like the West Bank, uh, whatever is being developed in Ukraine, that's not going to stay there. That's going to come here. It's going to be com com normalized in the commercial sector. Debatably, we already have that with tools like Siri, but that's another uh, toolbox to pull out at another time. But the problem is they know there's money in that. And I, I think that means that these, te these technologies will become more normalized in day-to-day -day life as well as they become uh, possible and then widely used during wartime. So to me, I unfortunately see it as all the same thing. I support any tech worker who tries to divest with this. And it's very sad to me that it seems increasingly we're dealing with a situation where it's hard to resist. Well, congratulations to those who are trying anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you for covering this topic so well. We've been speaking with Stavrula Pabst. Uh, we will have links to some of her articles up at talkworldradio.org. Stavrula, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.